Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going through Philippians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were at the 28th verse of chapter 1. The 28th verse of chapter 1. But what I want to do here at the beginning of this video is I want to direct your attention to John chapter 5. And we'll continue on in our discussion concerning not being terrified by our adversaries. So this will be part, sort of part two of, a, of my last video, part one. This one, part two of this, uh, of this subject of our adversity, our, advers our adversaries. And uh, for those of you who are just tuning in to this channel, you may find this a little bit unorthodox, but uh, I hope that uh, those of you who have studied through uh, these epistles with us that you will take the time to listen and that you will take the time to at least consider what I have to say when it comes to this subject because it is not a popular subject so I'm going to go ahead and, and read this uh, beginning at verse 1 in John chapter 5 after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. On the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. He didn't know who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So ends the reading of John chapter 5, and uh, or this portion of John chapter 5, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to study upon your word, to feast upon it, to meditate on it, to think about it. I just ask that you would strip away all of that foolishness, the tradition, the, the silliness, uh, all of that which is not of you, and just seal to our hearts that which is true. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. And when we look back here at our previous study, our, our study, ongoing study here in Philippians, chapter 1, verse 28, uh, we were told not to be terrified, not in one single thing, to be terrified by our adversaries. So, who are these adversaries? And how do they act? And why should we in any way be terrified by them? And I don't know, folks, that I have all the answers to that, but if we look at this account in John chapter 5, which many critics have said, it, well, it really shouldn't be there, shouldn't be a part of Scripture, 
It's, it's so absurd. It shouldn't even be in the Word of God. I mean, who would really believe that this angel came down at certain times into troubling the water where the first who stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had? Never happened. It was added later. Uh, did not appear in the earlier manuscripts. And I beg to differ. You know, they say, who would actually believe this? It must have been added to the text. But I don't believe that the account is absurd at all. What we see is that it is riddled with the idea of human merit. That's what we see. I believe the Holy Spirit, the, the thought that he intends to convey here is one of God's elective choice. First of all, that God has a right to choose that there's no human merit involved in this, in God's dealings with men. And the Sabbath figures into this quite heavily. First one in the pool, first guy in the pool. I mean, whoever that might be, that's the one that gets healed. And the merit attached to that is that he's the first one in. You know, we see lines forming to see who can get the best deal, the best seat, the first to get inside, you know, Best Buy on Black Friday. I mean, the, you know, the, the list goes on and on. We live in a system, a world system, and even a, an ecclesiastical system that is, for the most part, based on human merit. And people don't have a problem with that. They don't have a problem with that. What they have a problem with is what Christ did. That's what they have a problem with. First guy in the pool gets healed. You know, you got to wonder what it was like by this pool. How long? How long? You know, were they? Did they camp out there? You know, uh, uh, you know how many people? Uh, obviously, there was a great multitude. You know, I wonder how many evil thoughts went through the minds of those plotting to unseat the guy who was at the head of the line. You know, must have been really a, must have been a mob. As close to the edge of that pool probably as they could be, and now the Lord Jesus Christ comes up and the whole account is full of white spaces. You know, and people say, well, well Steve, you know, when you get invitations to preach, or to teach the Word of God, you know, you ought to try to figure out where there's going to be the most people, and that's where God wants you to go. And I see that there was a crowd there. And I can't tell you folks that Christ didn't preach to them. I don't know. But I see that he was intensely interested in one individual. And the fellow tells him the whole story, and Christ apparently allows him to do that. You know, I hear the man say, I don't have anybody to put me in when the water's troubled. And so I have to reach the conclusion that the only reason the man is there is that he senses the opportunity, he senses the chance that he could be the first in the pool. I believe the Holy Spirit expects us to see in this account how absurd it is for human beings to trust in foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm told that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. I'm going to keep on reminding those who do have ears to hear that at least one of your adversaries is the devil. And I'd say that's your primary adversary. The devil and his teaching, which is grounded in the manure of human merit. I've said this over and over again at, at, at great expense. It's, uh, it equates to my suffering for the sake of Christ. Verse 1 in. Got to be some reward. You know, if you answer all the questions, you get the $64,000 or whatever it is. We all know that that's the way that the scheme works. And now I'm asked to believe that there's a great multitude of people here. A great multitude. And if history means anything, this isn't a very big pool. And if everybody got in the pool, well, there wouldn't be any water. You know, and only one person can make it. Only one person. And 
what a filthy thing in which to trust. Now, now suppose you used to walk up and you used to tell the crowd, well, this isn't what y'all are doing here. This is not true spiritual worship that you're exercising here around this pool, but it's the worship of demons. I mean, how do you suppose you'd be treated? And you would, of course, be speaking the truth, but if you agreed with that first in gets the prize mentality, I imagine you'd become the hero of the crowd. The picture here is one of God's people being singled out of a large crowd of idol worshipers who was himself trusting in foolishness. That's the picture, folks. And I hear people talk all the time about the things in which they place their trust, their place their, their goals, their dreams, their hopes. Every bit as silly as is expecting an angel to come down and trouble the water where the first one in gets healed and no one else does. I think if you or I had walked by and, and paused to speak truth to those people about the deity, the majesty, the grace, the love of Almighty God and the person and the work of Jesus Christ, it, it would have created conflict. Preach human merit folks and you'll be accepted by the masses you won't have any problem preach christ you'll invite conflict it's interesting how the lord jesus christ in no way tried to refute the man's reasoning he didn't say you're foolish for doing this he didn't he simply said rise take up thy bed and walk i mean the simplicity of what was said rise take up thy bed and walk you suppose he repented? You suppose he believed, uh, accepted? He didn't do anything but get up. Well, suppose he hadn't gotten up. Well, he still would have been able to. Could have laid there and said, I can't walk, but, but he, he would have been able to walk. And I don't think he had to stand up in order to stand up. Like, you know, well, if he stands up, then the Lord would make it possible for him to stand up. That's that's about as foolish as, as anything ever was. And that's how silly some of the tradition that I hear really is. Christ didn't ask him to receive, accept, believe, repent, change his mind, or anything else. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't say one single word about not trusting in all that silliness in which he was trusting. He didn't do that. He just spoke the truth. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, I don't, want, I don't know what happened at that great moment. Somebody surely saw this man get up and walk. Somebody surely heard the Lord Jesus Christ say what he said. And I'm going to suggest to you that in speaking truth, Christ incurred the anger of that crowd. The first thing I see, or, or one of the things I see in this, is that it was God who did the selecting. It was God who did the selecting. Why did he speak to that man? Oh, Steve, you know, he felt sorry for him. We all know that the Lord is full of compassion, and he is. But, but he felt sorry for that guy. Well, so he didn't feel sorry for any of the rest of them? Yeah, he just felt sorry for him. That's, that's, what, uh, that's, that's what any good person would have done. Folks, for you to read into this account any human merit defines the conflict and you cannot read john chapter 5 without seeing that the very lesson that the holy spirit is teaching here is one of conflict the man was not healed by merit there was not something in him that caused the lord to single him out over anyone else other than the fact that he belonged to god it's beautiful Beautiful how we can see in the account that God knows those who are His and He provides for them. And I'm thrilled that I can see that it was not the man trusting in foolishness who was seeking for Christ, but Christ seeking Him out. You know, what Christ did wasn't, that was not the way to gain the praise or the approval of the multitude. It's probably why He slipped away. 
You know, as soon as Almighty God incarnate in human flesh chose one and showered grace upon that one, apart from any human merit, it resulted in conflict. And that jives exactly with what Christ said later in the Gospel of John. John 15. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You know, it, it wasn't so much that he healed the man, but that he chose the man and healed him on a Sabbath. I don't think people are going to get too upset over God healing somebody. But it, that it was done on the Sabbath and that Christ singled him out. That's what caused the conflict. The absence of merit. The presence of God's elective choice versus human merit. Law. The reason the world system hates you is because I chose you out of it, he said. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to this world system, a system that Scripture defines as a system of merit, a, a, an ecclesiastical system of religious principles. And it's not just Judaism. It's any religious system that professes to speak for God and outlines the ways of pleasing God through self-effort. You know, that from the, from the paganism of darkest Af Africa to any world system of religion today that would preach any means of human merit. Folks, the reason those systems become your adversary is because of God's choice. The reason those systems become your adversary is because of the absence of human merit. But of course, you know, we wouldn't mind God choosing, providing God chose only those who deserve to be chosen. The conflict arises when God chooses somebody who doesn't deserve to be chosen. And I'm sure that if we had some way of evaluating this great multitude, I'm certain that there would be the, those there whose credentials that we thought would better support God's choice than the man that he chose. We insist on bringing it back to human merit. Now the man walks away carrying his bed, and it was on the Sabbath day. Why the Sabbath? Was that a coincidence? Or was it because he was, Christ was speaking truth against the world system, which would rather look at the law of the Sabbath than the healing of the man? The very law that they profess it, that very law that very law allowed them to pull their donkey out of a pit on the Sabbath, but not allow this man to be healed. You know, who has the right to tell that man he, he could carry his bed on a Sabbath? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 16, the Jews persecuted Jesus and they sought to slay him because he did these things on the Sabbath day. Law. And so we see the exercise here of God's choice, creating adversity, creating conflict, the presence of no merit, which stimulates that conflict. You know, as far as the Jews were concerned, Jesus broke a law. You know, he broke a law which he didn't understand. That old Jesus of Nazareth, he doesn't understand this thing about the Sabbath. You know, you know you're not supposed to pick up sticks on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And this, you know, this Jesus of Nazareth, he just doesn't understand that. We need to straighten him out on this. And we read in verse 16, they persecuted him. They sought to slay him because he did these things on the Sabbath day. When the truth is that they didn't understand the purpose of the law, which was not to make a man righteous. It was to, to reveal man's sinfulness and his need for Christ. And the principle is clear crystal clear in the word of God that he who gave the law is above the law. So 
Back to Philippians, our present study, where we are in our present study. Folks, if you were to, to virtually choose any church, anywhere, anywhere today, and just stand up and preach that if you'll repent of your sins, if you'll be sorry for what you've done, if you'll come and accept Jesus Christ, then God will hear you, and then God will redeem you. But you, you got to act first. If you preach that, you wouldn't be in much difficulty. If you were to go to virtually any congregation anywhere and stand up and preach good Christian living, you know, let's say you don't rob banks, you don't uh, cheat on your income tax, you don't write checks that bounce, you know, you don't rob gas stations, you don't mistreat people, you don't kick cats, okay, I don't care, whatever. You preach any of those things, you'd be generally accepted. We all agree with that. You don't have to be headed for heaven to believe that it's not the best interest of society to rob your local 7-Eleven, okay? You don't have to be redeemed by the sovereign grace of God to believe those things. You know, if you were to stand up and preach any of those aspects of good Christian living, you'd be accepted. But... I suggest to you that if you were to go to virtually any church in any city and stand up and preach that it's by grace and grace alone that God chose you, and if He didn't, you don't have a chance, that God chose you for Himself, that He redeemed you, and you are absolutely complete in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be hated. Okay? Okay? Tell them in that he died, he um, he died unto sin once, and that he lives, he lives unto God. It's all done. It's a finished transaction. You tell that to virtually any church today, and it will begin to hate you. Not not openly in so many words, but in the way you you are treated. The conflict begins to arise when it is insisted upon that there's no human merit. Okay. And what we, what we know from John chapter 5 is that this is a turning point in, the, in this. This is where the Jews sought to slay him. It's, it's not that they didn't hate him before this, but they really hate him now. Okay? They want to kill him. I don't know how I can make it more clear, just as the text makes it so crystal clear that it's the sovereign choice of the Almighty God, totally separate from human merit, which is law, okay, which causes conflict. You know, I'm very familiar with that, though I've never been a part, really, I've never really been a part of that world religious system based on human merit. I'm very familiar with it. My mother, she couldn't divest herself from law, from merit, to comprehend the greatness of God's grace. We used to get in such arguments. I pointed out to you in our last study that the word terrified is the word to be startled to the point of bolting from your position of peace, joy, rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that it's actually used in classical Greek of a horse uh, uh, I think a horse race where you, you've got the horses all lined up ready to race. They're all in the starting gate and one of them jumps the gate. You know, that's the word. And I'm not certain that the word terrified really con conveys the best meaning. The Holy Spirit wants you, us to see. Don't be, don't be startled in such a way that you jump out of your position of grace. That God chose you. You know, over and over again in the Word of God, He calls you beloved. And, and resting within the very word beloved is the idea of choice. It's God who loved you, not you who loved God. It's God who chose you, not you who chose God. In the 15th chapter of John, the Lord Jesus Christ was very blunt. You did not choose me, but I chose you for myself, and I ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. He couldn't have made it any clearer to his own. But how do you suppose those words rang in the ears of those who were gathered by the pool of Bethesda? You didn't choose me, but I chose you. 
But why didn't he choose them all? Uh, well, that's a question you'll have to ask him. I'd rather ask the question, why did he choose any? You know, had I been God, I'd have probably said, you know, well, they don't want to listen to me. Let them, let them trust in that trash. And I wouldn't have chose any of them. The miracle's not to me that he chose one, but that he chose any. But I recognize immediately when I preach that God chooses and then showers grace separate from merit and separate from law, I invariably stir up conflict. You can't, you just, you can't help it. It's, it's going to happen. You know, people don't, they don't hate me for preaching don't rob banks. They don't hate me for that. Nobody hates me for that. They hate me because I would dare to suggest that God chooses, that God redeems separate from human merit. You know, the, you got to make the first move. God provided the means. He made it all possible. You know, you, but you got to make the next move. He's, he's just sitting up there. He's waiting for you. He's waiting on you to make that next move. And folks, I don't see that in the Word of God. I don't see anybody preaching to the man at the pool that the Lord has provided. You know, now all you got to do is make the first move toward him and he'll immediately respond toward you. I don't see that. I don't, I don't see anybody saying to Adam, you know, you sin, now go and seek the face of your God and repent. I see Adam hiding. And I see God saying, Adam, where are you? And then I hear some idiot say to me, boy, what kind of a God do you worship? He doesn't even know where Adam is. Well, he just didn't want to scare the socks off of Adam. He was announcing his presence. I praise God that he announces his presence to me. Don't, don't let any adversary in the area of merit, in the area of law, in the area of any adversary in the area of, of, of sovereign choice move you from that position of grace. Confidence. Peace. Rest and joy in the Lord. The fact that you are not terrified, you're not moved from that position, that you're standing fast in one spirit, not standing fast in your strength, but in the spirit of the living God, that very fact is a proof of their spiritual ruin and your deliverance. And I made it a point to state that I do not believe that because, that because Christ chose this man that all the rest of those people there around the pool of Bethesda went to hell. I don't think that we're, that's, we're to see that in the text. I don't think God is trying to say that at all. I believe that some of those who, who become your enemies, so to speak, are also members of the body of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. They can be members of the body of Christ because of their ignorance. And that their continuing in law and human merit will lead to spiritual ruin. We see that in the judgment seat of Christ, in the truth concerning Bema, the, the judgment seat of Christ. Their entire life's work is burned up, yet they, they themselves are, are, are saved, yet so is by fire. Destroy not with thy meat thy brother for whom Christ died. I see the same word used, word that God afterwards destroyed them in the wilderness who believed not. These were God's people. But I don't think because Moses didn't trust God that he went to hell. We have, without a doubt, brothers and sisters in Christ who have not yet opened up their eyes to see the grace of God in redemption as well as deliverance. Verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. It has been given. Okay? It's an aorist tense. It sees the action as a whole. And the word given is charisma. 
That's our word grace, given by grace. God graciously granted you something just as he graciously granted you life, just as he graciously forgave you of all your sins. That's, we know that from Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 2, all of your sins, all your trespasses already been forgiven. The word here is charisma, done by grace. God gave you by grace in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. That was a gift, just as redemption was accomplished by Jesus Christ dying in our place, just as that was a gift. So we've been granted the gift of believing in Him. Believing in Him doesn't redeem us. Believing in Him, it will deliver us from many a evil, but it does not redeem us. But in addition to giving us that, He, by grace, has given us the opportunity to suffer in Christ's place. Now, folks, it ought to be clear to us in John chapter 15 that if the world system, the religious system of the age, if, if it hated or if it hates present tense or if it hated Christ past tense and Christ dwells within you, then it's absolutely necessary that the, it hates you. Okay. And I take the world as any religious system based on human merit. I don't care what, what kind of religious system it is. Uh, even even we us here at, at Blessed Hope Forever, we're not some unique body of people who represent that purity, okay? We, you know, uh, Blessed Hope Forever, yeah, we're the cream of the Christian crop. Folks, we're a world system with a group of people who profess to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ who are in the midst of that conflict between the flesh and the spirit. So God gave us the opportunity to suffer in his place and in the main the world religious systems hate Christ and therefore they're they're gonna hate us okay and we are suffering in his place we are told in Colossians that we have the opportunity to fill up that which is lacking in the suffering of Christ I see God saying that that's a gift of grace and I don't want that I don't want to. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. But then I I go to the Word of God and realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so you know, rather than become discouraged every time somebody's eyes aren't opened. Every, every time that, that I don't get a lot of views on a video or every time I get thrust into, into conflict where that I'm hated, I have to remember that suffering, true suffering for Christ, is a gift of grace. You know, when, when Christ was here, he was the light of the world. When he left, we became the light holders. That world system can no longer attack Christ. It must attack me. It must attack you. And it will. And for some reason, God has given that to us as a gift of grace. For whatever, for whatever time God has left for us here, it is necessary for me to fill up that which is lacking, that which is not yet filled up in the sufferings of Christ. And we're going to look at that more in, a, in the next video. I want to, this is probably the next video will probably be where we cross over from uh, chapter one to chapter two into chapter two, knowing that there were no chapter divisions in the original text. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. I recognize without any doubt that the near application is the person of, of Paul in his prison cell and in the experiences that he had while in Philippi. But with every fiber of my being, I see the Holy Spirit saying to me that you see that conflict. It was there when the Lord Jesus Christ was here. And now you hear that it's still in me because I dwell in the body of Christ. The hatred of that religious system or any religious system based on law or merit versus 
the sovereignty and the majesty of God. It still hates Christ and can only do it in the person of his body. So I see more in verse 30 than just the person of Paul. But in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who dwells within me, look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you so much for those of you who have continued to study with us through Philippians. I thank you all for all of your messages which encourage me. I thank you for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. I thank you for your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.